everyone. And our next speaker is Petra Longi from ETH Zurich, and he will tell us about counting BPS states with exponential networks. So please. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction. And thanks for inviting me to this uh, beautiful workshop. I've been learning a lot. Um, yeah. So uh, we've heard already a few talks about, well, work related to spectral networks. And this talk will be a variation on that theme uh, about something called exponential networks. And um, the main subject of this talk will be the problem of counting uh, BPS states in a specific setting, namely M theory compactified on local Calabria trifolds. And uh, what I'm going to tell you about is the fruit of joint work with Sebastian Banerjee and Mauricio Romo, and you can read about it in, in these four papers. So just to uh, set uh, one goal for this talk, uh, the main goal perhaps will be to uh, solve the following problem. So given a local threefold X times S1 times R4, what we want to do is we want to determine the spectrum of M2 brains on holomorphic two cycles in X and M5 brains on uh, holomorphic four cycles and uh, the, their bound states. Now, this kind of question belongs to uh, a large class of problems. Uh, and this class of problems has some universal features. Uh, we've heard about these in several talks. But let me just set some notation. So first of all, there is um, always uh, involved a moduli space of stability conditions. And the point in this moduli space is what defines uh, whether uh, a BPS state is stable or not. Uh, and then for generic choice of moduli, uh, BPS states are characterized by some charge gamma. Uh, this is a vector in uh, an integral lattice, capital gamma. And then there's a, a skew symmetric bilinear form on the charge lattice uh, that's uh, in physics known as the Dirac pairing. And one of the most important uh, physical quantities associated to BPS states is given by the central charge homomorphism. So Z gamma is a homomorphism uh, well, Z is a homomorphism from the charge lattice to the complex numbers, and Z gamma is called the central charge of the BPS state with charge gamma. And then what it means to count these BPS states really means we want to compute some integer valid quantities. I'll just call them BPS invariants, and their precise meaning will then depend on the uh, specific context in uh, or the specific problem that uh, we consider. And of course, there's many uh, examples in this class. So uh, for example, in the context of um, coherent sheaves and uh, on X, uh, our local Calabria threefold, then the relevant notion of a charge lattice would be not quite, but roughly speaking, compactly supported uh, cohomology classes on X. And the BPS invariant would be the donaldson thomas invariant, so on the derived category of coherent sheaves. And in the context, uh, on the other hand, of gauge theories of class S, the charge lattice, again, roughly speaking, would be the first homology lattice of a Riemann surface, whereas omega of gamma would now be what's known as the BPS index uh, in the context of 4D and equal to field theory. Now, there's another universal property um, to this class of problems, which is the wall crossing phenomenon. And um, this is the statement that uh, a theory does not have a BPS spectrum. Uh, the spectrum will depend uh, on uh, which point in the moduli space of stability condition you choose. And there's a wall and chamber structure that's defined by uh, walls of marginal stability where the phases of some central charges uh, align. So if in one chamber you have some BPS states, gamma one and gamma two, um, then at the wall of marginal stability, these central charges would align and across the wall, the spectrum may jump by the appearance of some bound states of gamma one and gamma two. And what's been understood for a while now is that these jumps of the spectrum follow uh, certain rules. Uh, in particular, they're governed by a conservation law. So this is the description that was given by conservation Sobel and there are others. But so in this conservation law type of description, what you do is you assign some operator K gamma uh, to each BPS state in the spectrum and these operators do not commute and they're determined by the spectrum through the omegas. And then across the wall, the ordering of these operators changes according to the ordering of phases of central charges, but this change in the ordering is compensated precisely by the appearance of some new operators in the middle. So these new 
uh, bound states. Now, there's, uh, there's other problems in this class that turn out to be closely related to the one I'm going to discuss today. And uh, one of these is the computation of donaldson thomson invariants of certain uh, Fukai categories. And another one is the study of BPS states in classes theories. In fact, as we're going to see in the context of M theory on local Calabia threefolds, uh, well, both of these problems really come up naturally. And in a sense, they're really um, essentially the two phases of the same coin. So the connection to the first setting, Foucault categories, comes up if you start from M theory. And as we said, uh, our background includes a circle. If you shrink that circle, this leads to type 2 string theory. And the BPS states that we are interested in counting descend to D4, D2, and D0 brain bound states in type 2 string theory on X, the same Calabia. And uh, counting these BPS states has a mathematical incarnation known as, uh, well, uh, counting stable objects in the derived category of coherent sheaves on X. But then uh, mirror symmetry further maps this problem to uh, another one, namely the count of D3 brains in type to be string theory on the mirror Calabiao. And once again, this uh, problem has uh, a formulation in mathematics as the computation of DT invariants of uh, some Foucault category associated with the mirror Calabiao. So that's, that's how the connection to Foucault categories uh, comes up. And the connection to classes theories, uh, again, arises by taking M theory in a circle, shrinking the circle. So one gets type to a string theory on, on a Calabiao. And then taking a field theory limit leads to a description in terms of 4D and equal to quantum field theory on the remaining four directions. And then at least part of the spectrum of D4, D2, and D0 uh, bound states will now descend to the BPS spectrum of this 4D and equal to quantum field theory. So it turns out that for not all choices, but for suitable choices of X, this 4D quantum field theory is in fact a theory of class S. And then if that is the case, one can study the BPS spectrum of this theory uh, with spectral networks. And in fact, BPS states of classes theories correspond to calibrated one cycles on a Riemann surface, the cyber Witten curve. And what spectral networks do is they define a way to assign some integers. So they define, they define a notion of counting uh, these one cycles on, on this Riemann surface. So as I've said, these two frameworks, the dawson thomas invariance of a Foucault category and spectral networks really uh, will emerge together in, in the way that uh, we approach the main problem, which let me remind you, what we want to do is we want to count M2 and M5 brains uh, in X uh, times S1 times R4. So the way we approach this problem starts by uh, making a choice. So what we're going to do is we're going to choose uh, non-compact Lagrangian L in the Calabia. And just for concreteness, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to restrict uh, to the case where X is a toric Calabia threefold and L will be a toric Lagrangian, although this restriction is not necessary. But let's make this restriction. And then what we do, uh, so given the toric Lagrangian in X, uh, we're going to engineer a defect. Uh, which means that we take an M5 brain and we wrap it on L times S1 times R2. Then uh, this M5 brain has a moduli space, uh, which is well corrected by holomorphic disks, but it is known to be described by uh, an algebraic curve in C star times C star. And so this describes a curve and this curve will play a central role. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this curve to compute the BPS invariance omega of gamma from the geometry of this curve, very much in the spirit of spectral networks. Now, the first key step in this direction is, is an observation due to Clem, Derek, Meyer, Buff, and Warner, and it goes uh, as follows. So, so the first thing to note is that just because we chose L to be the toric brain, in fact, the Riemann surface sigma also coincides with the so-called mirror curve of X. 
in practice, the, the mirror club Yao is a, is a hypersurface in C2 times C star square, uh, described by this equation where F uh, appears. And then um, in the mirror setup, the BPS states that we want to count get mapped to D3 brains. Uh, these D3 brains, they will wrap some special Lagrangians calibrated by the holomorphic freeform. Then uh, what these authors observed is that um, the special Lagrangians have a uh, specific structure. In fact, notice that you can view this mirror club Yao as a conic vibration over C star square. So if you choose some point X and Y in C star times C star, then F gets some value and the equation U V equal F described a conic like this one. Uh, and this conic has some non-contractable S1. But then when the point X, Y lies on the mirror curve, F goes to zero and this point and this uh, circle shrinks to a point. So, so then if you take a segment connecting two points on the Riemann surface, say uh, two points of the same value of X, different values of Y, uh, then what you get is, an, is a two sphere uh, fibered over this segment. Now, the statement of Klemner, Marvath, and Warren is that the relevant special Lagrangians that we want to um, study are actually um, S2 fiber over arcs in, in the C star X plane. So if you take an arc connecting two branch points, you have this family of two spheres, uh, for example, shrinking at the two ramification points. And okay, so in this case, you get a special Lagrangian that looks like a three sphere, but uh, in fact, there will be some more general uh, types of topologies for the arcs that we take in the base, uh, corresponding to some more interesting topologies for, for the special Lagrangians. So once you have a, a Lagrangian three cycle of this form, then um, you can compute the central charge of that BPS state by taking the period of the holomorphic three form. And another observation due uh, to Klemner, Meyerhoff, and Warner is that the, the period of the three form actually can be uh, restated in terms of the period of a one form, uh, lambda, which is log y d log x, on cycles on sigma. So you take this saddle, you lift it to sigma, it defines a closed cycle. And then if you take the integral of lambda uh, uh, along that cycle, that gives you uh, the central charge of that BPS state. So just to recap, what we're starting from is a reformulation of the original problem. So, so the original problem of counting M5 and two bound states in M theory on X tensors one tensor four can be mapped by shrinking the M theory circle to type to a D4, D2, D0 bound states in the same Calabi-Yau. And then by mirror symmetry, this gets mapped to uh, the study of um, special Lagrangians in the mirror and D3 brains wrapping those. Hence the connection to Foucault capitalists. But then, Klemner, Waff, and Warner, they also uh, make the additional step of mapping this to the study of calibrated one cycles on a Riemann surface, which uh, greatly simplifies the problem. So that's a good starting point, but it leaves out uh, the important question of how do you count uh, these one cycles? That is, how do you assign some integer um, to gamma? And that's where uh, lessons from spectral networks become especially useful. In fact, uh, a similar problem was uh, encountered in the context of uh, Hitchin spectral curves, and it was solved using spectral networks by Gay Otomore and Nitsky. Now, the setup that I've just described is a little bit different, uh, but in fact, um, just understanding the physics behind the setup and how it relates to the physics that uh, underlies spectral networks turns out to give some important hints for how to uh, generalize ideas uh, of GMN to, to solve this problem. So essentially the main input that uh, physics will give to us is a different way of thinking about the Riemann surface sigma. As I told you, sigma first of all arises as the moduli space of an M5 brain wrapping a special Lagrangian uh, L uh, in the original Calabi-Yau. But in fact, when you wrap an M5 brain on a three manifold, 
times uh, some other three manifold, then uh, this admits a lower energy description in terms of a three dimensional quantum field theory. In this case, this would be a 3D n equal to quantum field theory on S1 times R2, and it can be written down explicitly. But the main point is that from the viewpoint of that quantum field theory, now uh, some of the geometric data that appears in the mirror acquires a very precise meaning. In particular, the coordinates X and Y will now correspond to a coupling of that 3D theory in the case of X, whereas a log of Y will now correspond to a field or some degree of freedom in the three-dimensional theory. Now, for a given value of the coupling, this theory has some dynamics described among other things by a superpotential whose uh, vacua correspond to, uh, well, the critical points of the superpotential correspond to configurations of this field, Y, that happen to be roots of this equation. So for a given point of X, uh, the corresponding points on sigma can be interpreted as vacua of this three-dimensional theory. And that's important because this three-dimensional theory has its own spectrum of BPS states, and these BPS states are configurations for the field Y that interpolate between two vacua, say, for example, between two points on sigma uh, corresponding to um, two roots for a given X. And this BPS spectrum of the 3D theory um, is characterized by some topological charges. In this case, it would be uh, open paths on sigma, whose boundary is run from a point yi to another point yj. And they also come with some central charge, which once again is the integral of the one form lambda that we saw before uh, along the, the, the path corresponding to the charge of that BPS state. But once you go down that route, uh, you immediately notice that, um, that there's a little bit of an issue. Namely, this differential is multi-valued because of, well, log y. So it's multi-valued on sigma. This leads to some ambiguities in the definition of the central charge, which is a physical quantity. So this should be well-defined. And so what this suggests is that we should, instead of working with sigma, we should work with the logarithmic covering of sigma ramified at the points where y goes to zero or to infinity. And I guess this, um, well, this logarithmic covering may not be so familiar. So let me motivate it a little bit further by just taking the simplest example, namely the toric brain in C3. So for the toric brain, um, the mirror curve is a three puncture sphere given by this equation. And now if we take a path A, on this Riemann surface, and we integrate along that path, the one form lambda log y d log x. So y being one minus x, that's the integral given here. So a primitive of that is the dilogarithm. And the dilogarithm has a non-abelian monodromy group, which ramifies at the three punctures, x equals zero, one, and infinity. Now, what's even worse is that this monodromy is not even by constant shifts. For example, if you take a loop around x equal to one, the dialogarithm shifts by multiples of two pi i log x. So that tells you that the ambiguity will even depend on the choice of base point. So the upshot is not even closed paths on sigma have well-defined lambda periods in general. So this kind of ambiguity that we notice for open paths is actually already there for the closed paths. It's really, it's really necessary uh, to go to sigma tilde uh, in this sense. So I hope this uh, is enough motivation. So, um, so let me now switch to this logarithmic covering sigma tilde. And what we're going to do is we're going to promote points on sigma yj of x to infinite towers of points on sigma tilde. Well, basically given by the finite label j for the sheet of sigma and some logarithmic label uh, capital M for the branch of the log. Then a bit more precisely, what a BPS state of this three-dimensional theory is, is a calibrated one chain running uh, between two sheets. And um, calibrated here means that the exact shape of this uh, one chain 
is determined by some differential equations. So these are um, a reformulation of the BPS equations for these uh, solitons. And they're formulated as equations down on the base of the projection, so on the C star X plane. So the differential equation involves um, the, uh, the two vacua that are interpolated by the soliton, so the two sheets of sigma tilde, I n and J m. And it's an equation for x as a function of tau, where tau is the proper time along this arc. And then there's a, a phase, e to the i theta, where theta is some global data about this uh, calibrated one chain. It's just the phase of the integral of lambda along the one chain. So this defines some arcs down on the base, but then these arcs can be lifted up to sigma tilde uh, between these two sheets, and they give you some one chains, which are on the BPS states. Now, at this point, you may be wondering why, why do we care about um, these arcs or these uh, open uh, one chains if all we want to compute are the omega of gamma for the closed cycles in sigma. And the main point is that uh, physics defines a way to count these three-dimensional BPS states. There is a well-defined notion of what it means to count them or to assign to each of these open one chains uh, a rational valued quantity known as the Chakotay Fendley Intrigator Buffer Index. And the reason why that's important to us is that it turns out that the spectrum of these three dimensional BPS states actually encodes the BPS invariance omega of gamma of the compact one cycles that we want to study. And the reason for that is, is actually, well, it's, it's quite deep. It goes back to ideas on 2D, 4D wall crossing by GMN, uh, appropriately lifted to 3D, 5D systems on a circle. So then the idea is to, first of all, find some way of computing this 3D invariance, and then find some way of computing omega of gamma from the 3D invariance. And in fact, I should say that both of these tasks are fulfilled, uh, at least in principle and to a large extent, by a piece of machinery called 3D TT star geometry, which however is, is quite complicated and uh, it produces much more information that is strictly needed for counting BPS states. So what I'm going to describe next is a construction known as non-abelianization for exponential networks which in a sense is some kind of topological reduction of the TT star framework. All right, uh, so that was my introduction. This could be a good moment if you have questions. Uh, otherwise, uh, the rest of the talk will be about explaining what exponential networks are, how they compute omega of gamma, and then I'll discuss a couple of applications to the computation of DT invariance for local F0 and the connection to quivers. Okay, so let's start with uh, some definitions about exponential networks. So let's take uh, an algebraic curve in C star times C star. And first of all, notice that any such curve uh, is going to be some puncture of Riemann surface where the punctures are uh, inherited from the ambient space. So you'll have some punctures whenever um, X goes to zero or to infinity and wherever Y goes to zero or to infinity. Then what we're going to do with this Riemann surface is we'll view it from now on as a ramified covering of the C star plane with coordinate X. And we're going to label the sheets by some finite label J. And I'm going to, the, to denote the branch points of this ramification structure by some crosses and the branch cut by some squiggly lines. Uh, these are objects that live on C star X. But then we also want to consider a differential, uh, in particular restricted to the Riemann surface, and it is multi-valued. And as we discussed, to, to make it single-valued, what we do is we go to a covering, sigma tilde. So this is a covering of sigma tilde over sigma. Uh, the ramification of this covering map occurs at the punctures because that's where y goes to zero or to infinity. That's where this differential branches. 
And so uh, these punctures will be marked by uh, some dots and the uh, branch cuts will now be living on sigma. So they will be labeled by uh, the sheet of sigma. And it will be denoted by some dash lines. All right, so given this uh, covering sigma tilde uh, over sigma over X, then an exponential network is a network of arcs or trajectories uh, on the base C star X. And the shape of these trajectories is determined by a differential equation, like the one that you saw previously as the BPS equation for the three-dimensional theory. Every trajectory is labeled by two uh, labels corresponding to uh, the sheets of sigma over C star X plus some uh, integer valued label that corresponds to a shift in the logarithmic branch on sigma tilde. Now, the only difference with the BPS equations is that here theta is, uh, it doesn't have any specific interpretation at this point. It's just an auxiliary parameter that parametrizes the exponential network. So there's, a, there's going to be an exponential network for every value uh, of the phase theta. So how are these trajectories defined? Well, uh, the shape is determined by these equations, but you need some boundary conditions to integrate them. And you always start from the branch points of the covering sigma to C star. And near the branch points, there would be three solutions in general uh, corresponding to uh, trajectories of type ij if the branch point connects sheets i and j. And for these trajectories, starting at the branch points, the logarithmic index is always trivial. So it's just zero. Then uh, using the differential equation, you can evolve your trajectories and they may cross some of the branch cuts. If they cross the branch cuts of the covering sigma to C star, then one of the labels corresponding to the sheets of sigma uh, may jump. They may change labeling of the trajectory. Whereas if you cross one of the logarithmic branch cuts, it could be then the uh, logarithmic index of the trajectory that gets um, uh, changed by plus or minus one. Another thing that may happen is that as you evolve these trajectories, they may intersect each other. And when that happens, there may be some new trajectories generated at the intersections. This will depend on whether uh, the labels of the two intersecting trajectories have one label in common or both of them. And well, right now I'm stating these as rules, but these can actually be derived um, uh, systematically. But, but let me just state these as, uh, as given. So what I've told you so far is, is a set of rules that allows you to draw what is the geometric data of the exponential network. And this is what it looks like. So given uh, some Riemann surface sigma, you can now write down or plot the exponential network. And it will be a set of trajectories starting from the branch points, possibly intersecting some of the branch cuts. Uh, this will change their labels. And whenever they intersect, they may generate some new trajectories and, and so on. And eventually for generic values of theta, all these trajectories uh, end up into the punctures of C star, namely X equals zero or X equal to infinity. So that was the uh, geometric part of the definition, but then exponential networks have an additional piece of data, which is known as soliton data. And to define that, let's uh, fix a point X on the base on a trajectory, say of type IJN, and I'm going to define gamma ij, then capital N and capital N plus N to be the relative homology uh, lattice of paths on sigma tilde. So this will be open paths on sigma tilde that connect the two pre-images of X running on these two sheets. So I comma N and J comma N plus little n. So uh, these are just classified up to relative homology and then uh, we'll package all of these together by summing over the capital N. So we only want to retain the information about the overall shift of the logarithmic index. 
All right, so this is so far is just some definition of uh, sort of a charge lattice for these three dimensional BPS states. And then, given this definition, the soliton data of a trajectory will be an assignment of some rational numbers, mu of A, to everyone, to each one of these uh, relative homology classes. In fact, as it turns out, this assignment will be independent of the specific point that you choose on the trajectory. So, so basically, it's, it's uh, assigned once and for all to the whole trajectory. So how is this data um, actually defined? Well, it turns out that the soliton data is, uh, in a sense, it's fixed by the global topology of the network of trajectories. And the way this is fixed is by some kind of uh, flatness uh, condition. So this is the construction of the uh, non-abelianization map. So let's say um, there is a, let, let's say someone gives us a flat uh, line bundle on the covering surface sigma tilde. Now remember, sheets of sigma tilde are labeled by some finite index i for the sheets of sigma and some infinite index n for the logarithmic branch. And now let's say uh, we take a path running between two sheets and I'm going to denote by xA as the parallel transport in the line bundle on sigma tilde uh, along the path uh, A. Now what non uh does is it takes this line bundle and it produces a flat vector bundle on the base, in this case on C star. And the first thing you may try if you want to do such a thing is you may take the line bundle in sigma tilde, you just push it forward down to the base and what that gives you is locally a flat vector bundle whose fibers will be direct sums of the lines of L on all the uh, points that lie above a point in C star, right? So you have the point X uh, in the base in C star, you have many sheets of sigma tilde. And on each of these sheets, you take the line of L, take the direct sum, and it gives you locally the fiber of this vector bundle on the base. And locally, you can parallel transport the fiber using the flat connection on L. But this is a local construction. It is obstructed by branching uh, on a global level. And non abelianization is a way to fix this. Um, so what you need to do is, uh, instead of doing this globally on the base, you, you take the base, you take C star X, and you define some local charts by cutting along the trajectories of the exponential network. Then on the complement of the network, inside each of these charts, you push forward L and that gives you locally um, a piece of your vector bundle. And then if two patches are separated by a trajectory, say a trajectory of type IJN, what you do is you glue together these two pieces with a non-trivial transition function, which is determined now by the soliton data that is attached to the trajectory that separates those two patches. So here, mu of A are some rational numbers. I haven't yet told you how they're computed. There are some rational numbers and XA are parallel transports along the paths that are part of the soliton data of that trajectory. So let me um, explain this a little bit more in detail with a picture. So let's say we have these two patches on the base, U alpha and U beta, they're separated by trajectory. Then my transition function will be some, well, infinite dimensional matrix whose uh, diagonal components I denote here as the identity, but what this really means is that if you now take a path in the base and you want to compute a parallel transport along that path, then this, di this diagonal identity components will correspond to taking the lifts of this path to the various sheets of sigma tilde, and then just taking the straight transport along, along those lifts. But then you also have some off-diagonal contributions coming from the soliton data, and this will correspond to parallel transports on, um, on sigma tilde obtained by taking now a detour. So if you start on sheet I, you can take a detour along the path that runs from sheet 
i comma n to j comma n plus n and it ends on another fiber of the line bundle l now on a different sheet uh, labeled by j comma n plus n so that that's the off diagonal contribution from the solitan data so that's how the solitan data defines some transition functions for this non abelianization map but how do you actually compute the solitan data so it turns out that all you need to do is you need to demand that this construction gives you a flatline bundle on the base. So for example, if you take parallel transport near a branch point and you take two paths going on the other side of the branch point, then the flatness condition uh, boils down to an equation of this type where you have to equate transition functions coming from these two trajectories or the product um, with a transition function from the trajectory on the other side. So it turns out that setting up this equation uh, and solving this equation uh, uniquely determines the soliton data on each of these three trajectories. And similarly, um, you can do this for intersections of trajectories. Um, and again, you get some constraints on products of transition functions on either side of the intersection. And in this case, they completely determine the soliton data of the outgoing trajectories in terms of the incoming ones. In fact, uh, as a side remark, uh, I would like to mention that these uh, equations that arise at intersections resemble uh, group commutators for uh, the loop group of a fine GLN. And uh, well, this is a generalization of a relation between the algebras and spectral networks that was observed, um, well, in previous work. All right, so, so then the claim is that the soliton data uh, is completely fixed by solving the flatness equations. Let me just briefly tell you what the solution looks like. So um, if you have a trajectory that starts from a branch point, then it turns out that the only non-trivial soliton data, the only mu of a, which are non-zero, are equal to one. And these are the solitons corresponding to essentially just simplest lifts of the trajectory to sigma tilde. So paths like this one. Uh, but um, in fact, there's infinitely many such paths, right? There's going to be one for each value of the logarithmic uh, index, capital N. Uh, similarly, if you have a trajectory that's generated by an intersection, uh, you can compute now the soliton data of that trajectory, well, by some formula that tells you uh, how to count concatenations of paths supported on the incoming ones. So if this is a trajectory of type IK, it supports paths that run from sheet I to sheet K. And the way you get these paths is by taking concatenations of the paths IJ on the IJ trajectory with JK on the JK trajectory. That, that will give you some concatenation and you, you have to take all concatenations in a given homology class, relative homology class, and then the count is given by a formula like uh, this one. Right, and then uh, there's also the other type of intersection, the one where you have infinitely many new trajectories. And once again, um, the flatness equations completely determine the soliton data on the outgoing trajectories. Things are a little bit more involved here. So I'm gonna skip details, but the claim is that um, with this, um, solutions to the flatness constraints, you get a full definition for the exponential network and what we call the soliton data that defines your uh, non-abelianization map. Now let's go back to the problem of counting BPS invariance to computing omega of gamma. So it turns out that uh, this has something to do with the dependence on the phase theta, remember for a given theta, we get an exponential network. And then given a network, we have a non abelianization map that takes a flatline bundle on sigma tilde and produces a flat vector bundle on the base. So this map is encoded by the soliton data of trajectories. And in turn, this data depends just on the global topology of the network. Now, this dependence on topologies um, is important because uh, for certain values of theta, the topology of the network uh, 
may degenerate. For example, saddle connections like this one may appear for bodies of theta. And whenever you have a saddle connection, as we said before, it lifts to some closed cycle on sigma. These closed cycles are the charges of the BPS states that we want to study. But this time, this gamma, uh, well, you can view it as the concatenation of the open paths carried by these trajectories. And because we know how to count the open paths, you may hope that there's some combinatorics for how to count their concatenations that leads to a way to count omega of gamma. So indeed, one can show that the non-abelianization map must jump, right? Because the topology of the network jumps whenever you have a saddle. And these jumps come with a universal form that is essentially very similar to what we've seen in uh, spectral networks already. So the claim is that when you take the um, soliton data of the uh, non-abelianization map, what you need to do is you need to perform a change of variables on the variables xa, the parallel transport uh, along the open paths um, carried by the trajectories, which are nothing but the k gamma operators that appear in the formula of conservation Sobelman. So it's xa goes to xa times one plus or minus x gamma to the intersection a with gamma times an integer, which is the BPS invariant that we want to compute. So the idea then is that if you, if you detect a saddle, this corresponds to a BPS state. And what you need to do to compute omega of gamma is you need to study how the non-abelianization map changes uh, due to that saddle. And by studying the jump, you get omega. So the simplest example of this is if you have two trajectories and you um, you go very close to the phase where they form a saddle and you compute the overall transition function across both of these trajectories. So overall, the transition function is the product of these two matrices. So these are really infinite dimensional matrices. I'm simplifying a bit, but the point is that you multiply them first in this order, XB first, XA second, but then after the saddle, uh, so after you vary the phase of the network beyond the point where the saddle appears, the ordering of these matrices gets exchanged. And, um, and you can see that the overall transport indeed jumps precisely by factors like one plus X gamma. And this reflects the fact that in this case, uh, omega is equal to one for, for a saddle of this type. But of course, there, there will be in general more complicated saddle topologies and more complicated uh, DT invariants. So using then uh, this, this idea, you can get the full BPS spectrum. So you fix a choice of uh, sigma. This fixes a stability condition because periods of lambda and sigma give you uh, central charges of BPS states. All BPS states will appear as saddles in the network precisely when the phase theta of the network is equal to the phase of the central charge of a stable BPS state. And studying the jump of the non-abelianization map gives a way to compute uh, the BPS invariant. So we've done some computations um, using this framework for a few uh, local uh, toric threefolds, including C3, the resolve conifold, um, C3 mod Z2 and local F0. And uh, in all cases, we, we seem to reproduce results uh, computed with other techniques, uh, for example, on DT invariance for coherent sheets on the original Calabia. So, uh, so that's, of course, expected uh, on physical grounds, but nevertheless, it's somewhat non trivial because the way we're computing these DT invariance is, is quite different from. Um, from the kind of computations that you would set up, for example, uh, in the context of coherent sheaves on X. And as I promised at the beginning, everything is computed just from knowledge of the geometry of the Riemann surface. That's the only input that, that you need to define exponential networks and to study their jumps. Now, so this, this basically uh, solved the problem that I 
uh, set out uh, at the beginning. So find a way to compute uh, the BPS invariance for these BPS states um, in this class of uh, geometries. But in fact, when you, when you try to do that in practice, you quickly find out that there's some practical issues with this approach. And the main issue is that pretty much in every example in local Calabria threefolds, uh, there are infinitely many BPS states. That is infinitely many saddles with non-trivial uh, omega of gamma. So if you want to compute the full spectrum, well, uh, this is not really viable. So a better strategy would be to compute directly uh, not just the single BPS states, but the full wall crossing invariant. Now, of course, one way to compute the full wall crossing invariant is if you know the full spectrum, you can write down the phase order product of K gamma operators, and that gives you the invariant. On the other hand, if you know the wall crossing invariant, you can deduce what the spectrum is by uniqueness of the factorization into operators of this type for a given choice of stability condition. But this operator, the wall crossing invariant, doesn't have to be factorized into K gamma operators, right? Uh, there's no need to invoke a factorization of this type. It just makes sense as an operator on its own. It is some birational morphism of a, of a certain Poisson torus. So then one can ask the question, is it possible to compute this wall crossing invariant uh, on its own, even without knowing anything about the omegas of single BPS states? So it turns out there is a way to do that. And um, what you need for this purpose is you need to find um, a choice of moduli, of complex moduli for the Riemann surface, such that uh, the phases of central charges uh, are maximally aligned, say they're all on the real axis. So the way this works is as follows. So remember that we have a non-obedientization map that's defined for certain values of theta. And then this map will jump whenever theta hits the phase of a BPS state. So whenever there is a stable BPS state, the non-obedientization map jumps. And it jumps by this operator, k gamma. So what is the wall crossing invariant? It's the phase order product of these jumps. So in other words, it's the overall jump of the non immunization map from, say, minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. But the point then is that when all central charges are real, there will be a single jump in the non immunization map. And so in that case, you don't need to study infinitely many saddles to get the whole spectrum. You just need to study the single jump in the non organization map that occurs for theta equal to zero. And that will give you uh, the wall crossing invariant directly. Now I should stress that uh, such a point, if it exists, may be on a wall of margin stability. So uh, at that point, the omega of gamma may not even be well defined, but still it makes sense to talk about S at least as the jump of the non organization map. And we also know that S doesn't, doesn't change across walls of margin stability. So, so you may as well extend its definition to the walls of margin stability, nevertheless. So let me uh, quickly show a couple of examples of how this works. So let's take the resolved conifold. Um, in this case, the charge lattice uh, well, is a subset of the homology lattice. Uh, so it's a sublattice of the homology lattice of this Riemann surface. And uh, it is generated by two cycles. Um, and their periods can be evaluated. So one of them is 2 pi over r, and the other one is uh, i log q over r, where q is the complex uh, parameter here. So then you see that if you take q to be on the unit circle, we satisfy the requirement that all central charges would be real. And if you do that, so if you take Q on the unit circle and you plot the exponential network at theta equal to zero, then you see the single jump of the non organization map. And you find indeed that basically all BPS states, or if you wish, all saddles of the exponential network now appear exactly at theta equal zero. So you get what's sometimes known as a BPS graph. 
And the claim is from this, from studying this single jump, you can compute S and then uh, if you wish, you can factorize S uh, by choosing some ordering uh, of factors. Well, in this case, it doesn't really matter, but yeah, then, then you can get uh, the, the BPS spectrum for the contour. So there's towers of D0 brains, and D2 D0 brains. Now, uh, a curious feature is that in this, in this example, in the case of the conifold, the intersection pairing, the Dirac pairing is actually trivial. So if you were to compute the action of S on the X gammas, this would actually be trivial. So the reason why we can still detect the wall crossing invariant is essentially because non-organization involves uh, variables XA labeled by open paths on sigma tilde whose intersection with a closed cycle can still be non-zero. And that, that's why uh, this works out. Good, so another example would be C3 mod C2. I'm not going to go through all the details, uh, but again, the idea is the same. You just find a choice of moduli for which central charges are all real. Once again, you find the BPS graph, namely the exponential network with all saddles appearing at once. And I just want you to notice what the BPS graph looks like because it will be useful in a moment. And once again, you can compute uh, the wall crossing invariant from the topology of this graph and factorize it if you wish to get the spectrum. And so on. So, so there's, a, there's some types of geometries, in particular those without uh, compact four cycles for which you can easily find points in the moduli space where all central charges are real and you get some nice BPS graphs for these geometries. But there's also some geometries where this strategy um, gets a little bit more difficult to implement. For example, when you have a compact four cycle, like in the case of local F0, uh, it is unclear, at least to me, if there is a smooth curve whose periods uh, are all uh, on the real axis. So the mirror curve of local F0 is, uh, well, is a genus one curve with four punctures. This is the equation. And the relevant charge lattice is rank four, um, where I take generators with this uh, intersection pairing. So gamma i with gamma i plus one are the only non-trivial uh, Dirac pairings. So what can you do in this example? So what you can do is you can notice that there are some choices of stability condition that are particularly nice. In particular, you can choose to have Z gamma one equals Z gamma three, this is a mutually local, and Z gamma two equals Z gamma four. And then what was observed by Clausé and Del Zotto is that if you make this choice of stability condition, you can easily compute great part of the BPS spectrum. You can use the so-called mutation method to, um, to deduce that there are infinite towers of um, hypermultiplex with omega equal to one corresponding to the BPS rays lying in the, well, in this fan between Z gamma one and the real axis and between Z gamma two and the real axis. So you get the whole spectrum just except the real axis. That's the only thing that the mutation method doesn't give you. So that's, it's a great step. But how do you get the missing states, the ones on the real axis? Well, if their central charge is real, they should appear in the exponential network as saddles just at theta equals zero. So you just need to study a single jump of the network. And if you plot what the exponential network uh, looks like at theta equals zero, well, it looks like this. And now, you may recognize that these are exactly two copies of the BPS graph for the half geometry, C3 mod Z2, that uh, we saw previously. So right away, we can tell what the BPS invariants will be. They're just twice the BPS invariants that we computed for the half geometry. And you can write down the full expression for uh, the wall crossing invariant of local F0 there's the hypermultiplets found by Clausé and Del Zotto, and then these should be the BPS states that 
are on the real axis. So there's towers of D0 brains and some D2 and D0 uh, bound states. So the claim is that this is the exact crossing invariant that gives you the spectrum uh, wherever you want on the moduli space by factorization into K operators. And uh, well, as a check, this agrees with previous results based on several types of techniques. It also agrees with another proposal for the exact expression for this that was computed by Mosgova and Piolin using the uh, flow tree formula. Okay, I think I have perhaps five minutes. So I want to say a couple of words about the connection to quivers. So the main point about this is that um, exponential networks, uh, so far we've, we've used exponential networks to compute the BPS invariance omega of gamma or the wall crossing invariant encoding all of these omegas. But in fact, there's a, a bit more information in exponential networks. So first of all, there's the soliton data counting the three dBPS states, but then there is also um, uh, information about the geometry of saddles, right? We, we don't just have counts of homology classes, we have actual representatives. These are uh, obtained by uh, lifting saddles to sigma. So this kind of data is precisely the kind of data that you could use to um, build up, well, at least part of uh, the definition of a Fukaya category of the mirror. So objects would be then the calibrated one cycles. Remember they descend from uh, special Lagrangians in the mirror Klabiao, which are S2 fibered over saddles in C star. And the morphisms then would be, um, well, there would be, so, so there would be intersections of these cycles that would generate the floor complex for two given Lagrangians. And then things like the floor differentials, the floor product, and the higher products uh, in the A infinity structure would then be encoded by holomorphic disks bounded by these Lagrangians. And all of these should be visible directly at the level of the exponential network. So you could use this data to study perhaps part of the structure of the Foucault category. And this observation is especially interesting precisely when you go to this point in modular space where central charges are fully aligned because uh, as we've seen, this produces a BPS graph where all saddles appear at once. And in this BPS graph, you can focus on, uh, well, some notion of basic saddles, basically the most fundamental ones. So for the conifold, it would be the D2, or well, the mirror to the D2 and the mirror to the D2 bar D0. If you lift these saddles to sigma, this is what they look like. And from here, you can read off uh, all sorts of data uh, that you want. So, so you can read off that there are four intersections. You can also see them at the level of the network. And you can read off the finite area of holomorphic disks. Um, there would be uh, two of them, uh, one in the front and one in the back in this case. And this kind of data can be conveniently summarized by quiver with potential. So, so nodes of the quiver would correspond to the basic saddles, arrows would correspond to intersections and the potential would be generated by these holomorphic disks. And the kind of quivers that you obtain by, um, uh, by this construction turn out to agree with those that you would obtain, for example, from brain tidings. And this has been checked again in a few examples, including C3, local P1, local P2, F0, and a few other examples. And actually there's some more precise statements about this correspondence to quivers. This is very nice paper by Eager, Simon, and Walter. They go much more in detail about uh, correspondence to quiver representations as well. I think my time is almost up, but um, I'm at the end. So, so to summarize, um, the main message here is that there's a non-abilization map for exponential networks. This map computes the BPS spectrum uh, of M theory on a, a local Calabia three field X tensors one times R4. And the way this works is really to define a count of special Lagrangians in the mirror. The way this definition comes up is motivated by physics, but in fact, in all examples we studied, um, 
these counts coincide with the DT invariance of the Foucault category uh, of the mirror. So that's, I think, uh, quite interesting. And this, this framework is especially uh, useful and interesting when you can find a point in the moduli space where central charges are maximally aligned. See, they're all on the real axis. Because despite the fact that this may be on a wall margin stability, you can still compute the wall crossing invariant of Konsevich and Sobelman. And moreover, um, you can see the emergence of the quiver description of the Foucault category. So the quiver can be obtained by dualizing essentially the BPS graphs. And then finally, I would like to uh, mention a few open questions that I think would be very interesting to explore uh, also in connection to uh, other work. So first of all, what is the precise relation to spectral networks? So as you may expect, shrinking the M-theory circle should reduce exponential networks to spectral networks. And indeed, this is the case. It can be checked and it has been checked in cases where this is expected to happen based on the choice of Calabial. But then, given this connection, uh, it brings up all sorts of questions. For example, whether there's a role of exponential networks as Stokes graphs for a suitable notion of exact WKB, and also whether the formal variables X gamma or XA are coordinates on some moduli space and on which kind of moduli space, and whether these coordinates could be realized, for example, through uh, certain types of Riemann Hilbert problems. As we know is possible, at least in some cases, like in the case of the conifold. And of course, there's further connections to, um, well, questions related to tau functions and topological strings that we've heard about in uh, a few talks earlier in the week. There's also um, directions related to quantization of spectral networks. We've heard about the talk of Hei Yan. So this would lead to the computation of motivic DT invariants. So right now with exponential networks, we can only compute numerical DT invariants, but quantizing exponential network would give a handle on the motivic version of the story. And there's also some very interesting work, recent work by Kahn and Moore on uh, categorification of structures related to uh, the physics that underlies um, both spectral and exponential networks. Another interesting question is um, relaxing the choice of toric Lagrangian. So I said at the beginning that we were restricting to toric brains, but you could run this program with any Riemann surface. In particular, you could choose instead of a toric brain, a not conormal Lagrangian, then the Riemann surface sigma would be replaced by the augmentation curve of the knot. And I think it would be quite interesting to explore what kind of re relation there is between the soliton data of the network and the knot invariants that are encoded by the geometry of, of the augmentation curve. And then finally, I should mention that, uh, well, some of the ideas that uh, appeared uh, in my talk uh, also seem to be closely related to, um, well, many, many ideas uh, from the math literature. I think there would be a lot to learn by properly understanding the connection to, uh, to these works, in particular to the work, well, to ideas of Konsevich and others on Lagrangian skeleta and on uh, Foucault categories of surfaces. In particular, something called the rough Foucault category could give us some uh, very important hints for how to extend exponential networks to uh, compute framed uh, BPS states involving uh, non-compact, uh, uh, well, D-brains supported on non-compact cycles. Right, I think my time is basically up. So let me uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'll take questions. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, yeah, Sergey, please go ahead. Thank you. This was a beautiful story. Um, I have one question about the role of uh, line bundle L over sigma tilde that, that is part of this construction. First of all, do we know how to describe effectively the space of such bundles? And second, are there any restrictions that you have to impose on L in addition? 
Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks for the question. So, um, right. So in this construction, the line bundle, so as you've seen, I've used very few properties uh, of this line bundle. So um, essentially, I think all I want is that it, it comes with some flat connection. Well, I should be a bit more precise. Uh, it's not quite, yeah, I, I swept a few details under the rug. So, so in this construction of non-abianization, which really goes back to GMN, um, we always want to work with a twisted version of a flat line bundle on, on Sigma. I think we've seen a little bit of that, uh, of details of that in Fei Yan's talk. But okay, besides that, I don't, yeah, I, I don't think there's many other constraints uh, on this line bundle. At least, yeah, in the case of exponential networks. So th th there's definitely a little bit more constraints. I think when you go to theories of class S, perhaps. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't know in, in our setting. I also have to say that the geometric side of this story is very, very obscure to me uh, at this point. Everything is very topological, uh, as I've remarked. Uh, so in principle, one way to get to this line bundle would be to study the actual 3D TT star setup uh, and some abelianization of that. But yeah, we, we haven't, haven't looked into that. Thank you. Andy? Hi. Um, uh, so in the, in the story of uh, the usual non-exponential spectral networks, there's this, there are these baby examples that come actually just from pure two-dimensional field theories, right? Like the, like the basic thing is to do like one branch point that just emits three trajectories and there's nothing else. Right. And that's a kind of good illustrative example for some for some things, right? It has to do with the area function. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, is there a similar kind of class of kind of baby examples of exponential networks that just actually have to do with three dimensional field theories that illustrate kind of some of the main phenomena? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So if you take, I think that's the case of uh, the C three, right? So if you take C three, the the mirror curve, as I said, is just a three puncture sphere. Now, the actual form of the Riemann surface in question will depend on something called the choice of framing. Uh, and it turns out that to properly define these exponential networks, you, go, you want to go to a choice of framing that's at least, that gives you a curve that's at least quadratic in Y because you want to have at least some pair of sheets to, to run your trajectories. But let's say you make such a choice. And if you do that, if you just choose the quadratic framing, it turns out there's a single branch point and with three trajectories coming out. Now the novelty is that um, in that case, uh, these three trajectories will have mutual intersections because you can have this ij, ji type of intersections and there will be then infinitely many new trajectories generated and so on and so forth. And if you study that example, uh, well, of course the spectrum you find is just an infinite tower of D0 brains. So it's just pure D0 uh, bound states. From the viewpoint of field theory, so, well, uh, so if you take M theory on a local toric threefold, that may engineer for you some 5D on a field theory, but in the case of C3, uh, that, that field theory is empty. So what you're left with is precisely the 3D theory that lives on the brain. And the 3D theory that lives on the brain is 3D U1 gauge theory with a, a single chiral multiplet. So, so then, then you're studying the TT star geometry of that. That, that's the most basic toy example I can think of. Great, and, and, in, and in that case, where does the framing show up in, in the, if you're just purely in the three-dimensional field theory world? Ah, so from the viewpoint of the three-dimensional field theory, the framing is a choice, uh, well, it corresponds to uh, the churn simons coupling for the gauge field of this U1 gauge linear sigma one. It's just the churn simons coupling of the gauge linear sigma one. So, so in fact, uh, the, you know, so when you when you compactify this 3D n equal two field theory on a circle times R two, you, you, you can compute a twisted superpotential uh, in, in the sense of 2D two comma two field theory. You can think of it as a KK tower of 2D two comma two field theories. And um, but but then the the novelty from from 3D is that you, you get some churn simons coupling that contributes to that. 
and that, that's going to be some something quadratic in sigma in the yeah, and that, that, that's where it shows up. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Tom, please go ahead. Hi, thanks for a very nice talk. Um, this, uh, I, I was just asking about this spectrum generator, you know, when you take the product over all the rays. Um, were you claiming that was a birational sort of map? And is, if so, is that clear? Or I mean, you, you know, it's an infinite product, right? So it, it, it's not no. obvious to me that it's a birational map. No, it's not obvious. Yeah, I, I don't think I should claim anything like that. Uh, for, for us, everything is a little bit like, formal series here. <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, okay, that's, that, that, yeah. that answers my question. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Anything else? I ask a quick question, perhaps. <clears throat> um, I mean, you mentioned this uh, C3 example uh, as, a, as a basic one. Is there any tri trace of uh, perhaps a kind of gluing game on the level of DT theory, which would uh, uh, resemble the story of topological vertex. Uh, right, thank Could you. it be that, for example, if you just, for example, have large scalar parameters uh, separating uh, C3s or so, that uh, you have a relatively simple um, 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 description, which basically reduces to what happens on the C3, perhaps with something which happens in between? It's a fantastic question. So. Uh, I can tell you this has an answer in the case of class sigma geometries, uh, the one that uh, you talked about. So, so for theories of class S, we, we, we know how to, to, to glue together the BPS graphs coming from, um, you know, so, so, so if you take a path decomposition, we, we understand how the BPS graphs glue together. The claim then is that each of these BPS graphs uh, would generate sort of the BPS spectrum on each pair of pants or on each Riemann surface singularly, and then we know how to glue them together and we know how to compute the wall crossing invariant of, of the glued surface from the BPS graph. Unfortunately, things look a lot more complicated for exponential networks. And this is something we would really like to understand, but so far haven't succeeded. I, I think there's work uh, in the mathematics literature um, being done precisely on this sort of question, uh, gluing, um, well, so some notion of gluing for uh, Foucault categories of um, mirror curves and things like that. But <laughs> what, what, what are the names to well, I, th to this? I think at least Vivek Shende has been looking yeah. into something like this, uh, but there may be some more, maybe to be a system. Yeah, I, th there is this uh, Ganatra pardon Shende yeah. papers, uh, which tell you how to glue pieces uh, oh, okay, so so the the skeleton would really be sort of uh, the say toric diagram then uh, describing uh, how to glue C threes to a toric Calabi-Yau and so on. That, that yeah, the, the picture there. That that's more or less the picture. So you you, you need there is something in this story which probably should be added also in Pietro's story where in that's that of a stop. So mm -hmm. so somehow you have these Lagrangians stretching out to infinity and you basically add infinite ends there and that's where you glue. So, so, so you mm -hmm. have to treat, you, you, you have to take the infinity of C3 and put there the Schoandrians, which seem to this Lagrangian skeleton. And then the gluing appears there and, and algebraically um, become certain push out diagrams of, well, of categories, but, but really of algebra. Mm -hmm. so, so it's, it's like, uh, very much like uh, Seifert van Kampen theory theorem for fundamental group about so, souped up into this mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. world. But that requires exactly these special conditions at the black dots on uh, the bundle L over sigma tilde. Yeah. So that, that's the subtlety I was trying to find out the answer to. In, in a way, things have to match once you start gluing them, if, not That's only right. on the level of surfaces, but also on the level of the bundle. Right. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, any other comments or questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again.
And I guess we can come back to the original schedule. So we'll start in 10 minutes and it's going to be the last.